Hey everyone, welcome back to Keto and Crime. Here I am with a uh, week three, day one in the Chad Daybell trial. This is the testimony that took place yesterday. If you're watching this video on the same day it was published, Tuesday, April 16th, then this is the testimony that took place on Monday, April 15th. Uh, before we get started, my name is Tracy. I run this uh, channel. It is true crime, dark history, horror movies, uh, I also have a holiday tree that I update with the holidays. I have finally changed it. I was two holidays behind. Now it is Cinco de Mayo, complete with uh, little tacos and fans and maracas. And I think it's fun. But anyway, I'm glad that you're joining me. If you're new here, welcome. I hope I earn your subscription. If you are a past viewer, thanks again for coming back. And with that, let's dive in to what happened yesterday in the Chad Daybell trial. All right, so uh, it started around 8.20 a.m. Idaho time in the Fremont County Courthouse. Uh, there was about 30 minutes of debate about the admit, admit, whether or not uh, information about uh, Alex Cox's encounter with Joseph Ryan all the way back in 2007 should be admissible. Uh, finally, jo uh, uh, John Pryor had been arguing this Finally, the court uh, decided that uh, those could not be referenced moving forward. So this is when Alex Cox, Lori, Vallow Daybell's brother, who is considered her enforcement angel, was uh, threatened uh, Joseph Ryan, who is Tylee Ryan's father, uh, and went to jail for that assault. So those cannot be referenced when setting up that Alex was a big old baddie. So... Um, Basically, then we get into the next round of witnesses. We just are coming off uh, Detective Ray Hermosillo's uh, testimony from the previous week on Thursday. And uh, we get started with uh, the prosecution's case. He is calling a detective or, excuse me, a chief, chief deputy, Vince Kakamunu. Uh, to the stand. He is a lead investigator with the Fremont Sheriff's Office and was there on the day that Chad Daybell's property was searched. Kakamanu is uh, over the jail telephone system. So he talked about how that was recorded and how uh, those recordings are treated. And he verified Chad Daybell was not in jail, but Lori Vallow was. And he called or they had a conversation that day. She actually called him. I had it backwards there. So they talk a little bit about that call. They do play the recording, the jailhouse recording of that call. You know, it, bo it basically goes down to Lori saying, hey, babe, are you okay? And Chad simply goes, they're searching the property. Uh, and Lori goes, the house, right? And he says, yes, yes, but the property too. And then he talks about, so Mark Means will be talking to you. And Lori asked if they are in the house. He said, no, they are out on the property. And uh, he, uh, Lori asked if they're seizing stuff. And uh, Chad goes, no, they're just searching. Uh, basically, Chad uh, tells her to pray for him. And uh, he also tells Lori to get in contact with Mart, meaning Mart means for Chad's former attorney. They tell each other they love you. That's not true anymore, evidently. And so uh, Wood then has no further questions for Mr. Kakamanu. And now uh, uh, John Pryor will cross-examine him. Uh, Pryor asks uh, how many officers were at Chad's house that day. Asks him uh, about the interruption that is overheard on the call when somebody interrupted Chad. He asks uh, Kakamunu if he knows who that is. He says he does not. He did not see that. And then he asks uh, if Chad placed any calls from his daughter Emma's house, which sits kind of catty-cornered to their house. And he says he does not know. Uh, Pryor then asks Kakamunu if he interviewed Melanie Gibb, and he says he has at one time. 
but he did interview Garth Daybell, one of Chad's sons, and he says he interviewed him one time at the police department, and he said he also went to the school where Garth teaches uh, with one of the many FBI agents working the case. So he has had significant contact with Garth Daybell. Uh, he asks how long Garth was at the Rexburg Police Department for an interview. Linda said a few hours. They got him McDonald's and a soda. Garth uh, said asked for an attorney and a lawyer was brought in. Pryor asks if Kakamunu had reviewed the videotape of Chad and Emma. He said he has not. Uh, Pryor asks if anyone on the scene uh, at Chad's house on June 9th was not law enforcement. He said the coroner was there and some canine dogs were there. They worked from 7 a.m. to about 5 p.m. And then Pryor has no further questions. We go back into prosecution redirect where uh, Rob Wood asks him if he has monitored any other calls that Lori and Chad have engaged in on the prison communication system. He says, yes. Uh, he then asks um, if there was any difference in the tones. And he said not that he realized they stayed pretty monotone the entire time. And he also asks if, there were 30 officers on the property. Would that be discernible? And he says, probably yes. He said he did think that Chad seemed a little more hesitant and guarded than he had been on former prison calls. So Kakamunu is released at that time, uh, but he says that he will probably be called, the judge noticed that he will probably be called as a defense witness as well. So we're going to see a lot of these witnesses going back and forth for certain parts of their testimony to benefit either the prosecution or the defense. Uh, the next uh, prosecution's witness is Rexburg uh, Detective Eric Wheeler. He, he takes the stand. Uh, Deputy uh, District Attorney Rocky Wixom is questioning Wheeler. Wheeler has worked for Rexford the Police Department for 18 years. He was a patrol sergeant before becoming a detective. Uh, he was at Wixom asked Wheeler if he assisted in the search on June 9th, 2020. He said that his job was to maintain a traffic control security while the investigators searched. They kind of go over what happened there that day. Uh, during the search, Wheeler said that he found remains of Tylee and observed the remains of JJ's. He says Tylee's remains were found near the fire pit slash pet cemetery, while JJ's remains were found near the pond at the rear of the property. Uh, Wheeler says when he arrived, he simply helped maintain traffic and stood by as the detective served the warrant to Chad. He said he was, was to direct traffic, observe the occupants of the home as they were coming and going, and to ass assist and kind of oversee with the searching. Uh, Wheeler said he arrived at the home around 7 a.m. He said there were multiple law enforcement agencies there, from Rexford Police to Fremont County Sheriff to the Federal uh, Bureau of Investigation. He said that he saw Chad Daybell leave the home around 7.30 and walk to his vehicle. We've already had testimony on this where he sat in the car and had a conversation. Uh, Wheeler says he moved his vehicle to the spot where he had a better uh, location of the pond area. He sat in his vehicle and was on a phone for a while, as we've already heard. He, Wheeler said he just sat there. Wheeler said there were multiple times he saw Chad looking awkwardly over his shoulders toward the cadaver dogs and the investigators where they were looking at the pond and at the fire pit slash pet cemetery. He says Chad was scribbling on a was kind of just sitting there. Uh, it was observed that he may or may not have been taking notes. But uh, basically, Chad was nervous is the whole gist of this. He said at one point, Chad got out of the vehicle, walked around, then got back in. He made another phone call. He drove over to his daughter Emma's house. And then Wheeler said Chad had a brief conversation outside and then went into her house. And he was inside for about an hour and a half. Wheeler said that when Chad left the property, he appeared to be in a hurry. Detectives were assigned to follow him. Uh, Wheeler told a de a Detective Schmidt that Chad was leaving in a vehicle, and other investigators came running over saying, stop him. Wheeler said he heard Chad accelerate and thought, is he trying to run? 
Wheeler stopped Chad around the Fremont uh, Madison County line and asked Chad to get out of his vehicle and said detectives were on the way to talk to him. Wheeler says Chad didn't ask any questions, wasn't shocked or surprised when he stopped. So it sounds as though Chad just kind of got to the point I got to run and took off and was, you know, pulled over. A uh, Whitsum asks uh, Wheeler, is there some interaction with Chad? He says that Wheeler says he placed handcuffs on Chad. He was told he was being detained and Chad was put in Wheeler's patrol vehicle. Chad was told JJ had been found. Wheeler said there were three cameras inside his vehicle and Wixom moves. Uh, and then Wixom asked to admit the video camera from inside the patrol car. And that was played for the prosecution. Uh, they're normally over an hour long, but this was cut into about a 15-minute increment to play in court. Uh, you can see Idaho, East Idaho News' live coverage of it, which will have all of this. As I said, my purpose here is to provide a short summary in case you don't have time to listen to the full stream. So I won't be playing any testimony or recordings here. I will reference those that have been come popular and talk about what was in them, but I, I won't play the full recordings here. Uh, so it kind of shows Tad, uh, Chad Daybell, uh, in the back seat of the car, uh, talking to, uh, Emma after they've returned him to the property. Emma comes up to the window and she is crying. She says, I love you so much. And she hugged him through the window. Uh, Wheeler then explains the position of his vehicle relative to the Daybell property. Wheeler says he parked on the south side of the residence facing west. Uh, he said, if you were to, look right outside of the open door, you would be looking at his house. So he kind of positions where when they brought Daybell back to the property where they set him. Uh, Chad asks Emma on the recording if <clears throat> they're pausing the recording for uh, Wheeler and Wixom to discuss what was in it. They uh, Chad asks Emma to go get his wallet um, and Lieutenant Ball, Lieutenant Ball of Rexford uh, Police Department asks if he can look through it. Uh, Chad says, sure. Emma, uh, Chad says Emma will be running his finances and uh, while he's incarcerated, because obviously he going to jail. Um, and Chad tells Emma there's about $9,000 in a uh, middle drawer in Son Mark's room. Remember, Mark Daybell lived with Chad at this time. Uh, Chad gives all of his financial information to his daughter, including his banking passwords, uh, he goes through all of his credit cards, his bank cards. He tells him where the company business card is for the uh, now defunct publishing company. Uh, he also tells her where $9,000 in cash is. Chad tells Emma the card uh, to be used for uh, tailmate so she can call him at the jail. And Emma says she already has a tailmate account because she's been talking to Lori. And uh, Chad tells Emma to put $30 a week on Lori's commissary. I bet she's not doing that anymore. Uh, and so they tell each other they love each other and pretty much their conversation kind of ends with a little bit of joking and ribbing back and forth. Wheeler did say that at this point, Chad has not been arrested, but they said it's, you know, pretty much he's being taken in for questioning and they, with the bodies being found on the property, he ain't coming back. So they discuss her making his mortgage payments, his car payments, blah, 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 blah. And then Chad admits, I'm probably not coming back he tells emma he had told emma the house is hers and that he will be talking to john Pryor about financial arrangements as we know now that house and property were pretty much given to john Pryor to pay for everything that he's doing for chad uh now uh emma then talks to the police officers asking if things can be sent uh, from amazon to the jail uh, he says he has some Amazon gift certificates and kind of goes through a lot of back and forth between Chad and Emma on how to deal with his finance. After his conversations with Emma uh, stop, there's a point of the recording that they had trimmed down uh, that kind of shows uh, Chad just staring out the window, not really saying anything. And Wixom decides to ask Wheeler, where is he staring? Now, remember, they've already told him they found the body, which turned out to be J.J. at the pond. So now Wheeler says that Chad is staring towards the fire pit and the pet cemetery where later Tylee's remains were found. So he knew they were there. He knew they were there, no matter what, you know, Freaky Pryor says. He, he, knew, he knew they were there. 
then he Wheeler said that he was asked to transport him to Chad to Fremont County Jail, where his mugshot was taken, the famous one that we all know. Wheeler then returned to the Daybell home and began helping to search the fire pit area. And that is where, of course, we know that they found Tylee's remains. Uh, Boyce, uh, <clears throat> Judge Boyce then orders a small recess and a defense cross-examination then begins. And as Pryor often does, he re, you know, reiterates w who Wheeler is, his credentials, how long he's been with Rexburg PD, and then asks him if he wore a camera that day. I know you have to do these kind of things sometimes, but we just watched footage of the camera playing with the entire Chad Emma situation. You're asking this officer if he wore a camera. And he says that, yes, he wore his body camera and the camera inside his car was rolling. So Wheeler then goes through all the events of the morning. We've already heard uh, how Dave got into his car, moved it, and then t uh, went into Emma's house and then left southbound. And then he was brought back and we saw the entire reiteration. Uh, he then uh, asked Wheeler to confirm that to his account, Chad was in Emma's house for 90 minutes. Uh, Chad's, I mean, uh, Wheeler says yes. Uh, he also asks if uh, Chad was speeding away, and he said he was he was going faster than the speed limit, which is 50 miles per hour. But he said, would it not be, uh, Pryor says, would it not be common for somebody to, or usual for somebody to accelerate once they get on the highway? Wheeler says, yes, that would not be unusual, but then confirms he was going at an extended rate over 50 miles an hour. Basically, what Pryor's trying to do here is say that Chad wasn't fleeing. He was simply trying to clear his head. He was just driving down the road. He wasn't running from a murder scene that he helped cause. Uh, so anyway, because I really believe the children were killed on the property. I do, but that's me. Uh, take that with a grain of salt. So, but Pryor goes back and forth, kind of rehashing a bunch of stuff that was said. Wheeler often says that he can't, there's a few things that Pryor's wanting to Wheeler to answer that he says he can't testify to because he wasn't actually laying eyes on Chad at that moment. And Mr. Pryor basically spends about 15 minutes asking Wheeler about how many times Chad looked at the fire pit, looked at the pond, Seemed to ignite that he seemed to acknowledge that bodies had been found. Wheeler reiterates that they told him they found JJ's body or a body that appeared to be JJ, and that he was very, very nervous, kept looking over at the fire pit. Um, prior then asked Wheeler about some things that Emma had said, uh, that Emma had told the police detectives that she thought her father knew not nothing that was going on from the blank look on his face. Wheeler says that he that statement was made, but it was made by his daughter. You know, pretty much this is a smart detective. He's not letting Pryor lead him into any sort of hearsay or anything like that. Um, he then questioned Wheeler about his return to the uh, house about one thirty after taking uh, Chad in, uh, and it kind of asks, Pryor asks what they used to dig in the dirt, with, you know, in the fire pit and pet cemetery where Tylee was eventually found. He says they had shovels, sifters, and hand tools. And then Pryor has no further questions. Uh, Wixom then redirects for the prosecution and asks um, about how people act during tra traffic stops. And he's, Wheeler says, and most people get a little nervous during a traffic stop. Uh, and then Wixom asks, if you, in your experience, if someone is about to be discovered in a crime, about to be caught in a crime, have you ever experienced someone just acknowledging that and surrendering because they are caught? He says that Wheeler said it's common for suspects to try and distance themselves. Wixom uh, follows up on the speed issue that Pryor brought up about, you know, he, he was just accelerating to get on the highway rather than speeding away. And he asked if someone who had bodies buried on their property might accelerate quickly to get away from the property. Wheeler says yes. So just as Pryor was trying to use Wheeler's expertise to say that, yeah, it's common to speed when you're pulling out of a driveway, blah, 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 blah. He's also, Wexham's turning that around, which is a very smart move, and having Wheeler's same expertise, the one that Pryor has already acknowledged by trying to use it, 
but yes, people trying to get away from a, a, a crime scene would also speed. So the two kind of cancel each other out, which is just brilliant on the part of Wexham. He then, uh, you know, asked him a few more questions about how things were searched. Uh, he asked him exactly what was found uh, in the fire pit slash pet cemetery. And of course, we know it was a portion of a skull, a melted bucket, some other charred and melted, partially melted bones, and that they were clearly decapitated. Uh, Wheeler says that all conduct by the law enforcement was by the book and that then they were transferred to the ownership of the coroner. Uh, basically, Pryor objects to this for some reason, uh, and there is a sidebar in the judge's chamber. Um, and then the argument was that Wixom is trying to turn up that Chad knew he was guilty and that Pryor's opposed to that, obviously. But, yeah, just very convoluted. Uh, he objected a lot. Uh, I mean, not he. the attorney in the Lori Vallow case objected a lot, too, so it's no different here. But basically, a judge voice does strike the question about whether Chad looked shifty from the record. And then uh, Wixom asks Wheeler to clarify that he was not directly involved in JJ's remains. He said he was not, but he did watch the entire search from his vantage point. And that the only time uh, he saw any law enforcement go into the house was at the beginning of the day when they served the search warrant. Uh, Wixom again asked Chad where, uh, asked Wheeler where Chad was looking while in the driveway. He says toward the fire pit. And then Wixom has no further questions. And of course, Pryor wants to do another redirect. He asked Wheeler if he had spoken with any other law enforcement officer during the break. Wheeler says he did not. Uh, Pryor asks about Chad leaving and when he learned about the remains being found on his property. Wheeler explains that when he left, it was from Emma's residence shortly after Wheeler learned that JJ's body had been found. So Pryor asks if Chad knew at the point, at that point, that he had been told anything. And Wheeler says at that point, Chad would likely not have known. Wheeler's testimony is then concluded and that they might he might be called either by Pryor as a defense witness or Wixom on a further uh, redirect later on. Then the prosecution calls Fremont County Lieutenant Joseph Powell. Powell has served uh, the sheriff's office for 22 years. And again, Assistant District Attorney Wixom is the one questioning uh, he asked Powell if his roles include getting involved with unintended deaths. Uh, Powell says yes. And an unintended death, by definition, is when someone discovers someone else's death and there's nobody else around when it happened. So basically discovering. And so he's questioning, Wixom is questioning Powell specifically on the, about the morning that Tammy Daybell died, October 19th, 2019. Powell said he was notified of Tammy's death by a deputy. Uh, he said that on October 31st, 2019, Powell got a call from law enforcement in Arizona uh, inquiring about Tammy Daydale's death, and they sent a copy of the death report to Arizona at that time. Powell said he did review the report and requested Tammy's medical records. He then sent the information to Gilbert Police. Uh, Gilbert Police had also asked Powell if he could locate the Gray Jeep Wrangler, which was previously owned by Charles Vallow and driven by Tylee. They told him they believed the Jeep was in Fremont and it was involved in an attempted shooting. So uh, that is the first time Powell was given the names of Alex Cox and Lori Daybell, uh, telling them they might have ties to local resident Chad Daybell. Ch uh, Powell said he drove to Chad's house on October 31st, 2019. He said the Jeep was not there and Powell notified Gilbert police of, of the same. The next day, Powell got an email asking if he would check one more address about the Jeep. And so uh, a couple of more addresses for the Jeep. And one was a P.O. box in Sugar City and another was Lori's apartment in Rexburg. Powell assisted with the surveillance on Lori's depart apartment that we've already talked about or heard about. And Chad, he saw Chad leave the apartment uh, on the mo morning of November 1st, 2019. Powell then consulted with Rexburg police as Lori's apartment was in Rexburg. So a lot more on procedure and, and things of that nature uh, in this testimony.
Hal said he did tail Chad when he left Lori's apartment on November 1st, 2019, and followed him to uh, Mountain American uh, Credit Union. He then lost him, and but then uh, followed, did backtrack back to Lori's apartment, and Chad had returned. Lori and Chad then left. They went to Hobby Lobby. They were seen holding hands, going in and going out, and then they drove to Cafe Rio to have lunch. And at this point, there is a break as they went into lunch so now we are back with uh, lieutenant powell being questioned by uh continued to be questioned by assistant district attorney wixom so <laughs> wixom moves to admitted uh, an exhibit powell testifies that chad told a deputy that tammy didn't go to the doctor very often and the last time she had seen the doctor was two months prior for an arm injury powell ran her name through the law enforcement prescription program to find out if she was on any medicine. She was on tramadol and uh, Bluextine, which were both uh, antidepressants. Wixom asked to admit uh, the prescription report as exhibit. Uh, Boyce then uh, sidebars with the attorney, and then Wixom does publish the exhibit. A little bit of it was blurred and kind of hard to read, so I think that was the discussion about whether or not it could be admitted um we returned to the questioning uh he's pal then said he went back and requested all of tammy's uh medical records uh for the past two years and uh then that record is also put up on the screen for everybody to look at uh pal did admit that she appeared to be relatively healthy so she he did get a warrant to exhume the body to see if anything was you know fishy there. Powell said he worked with the court in Utah and had Tammy exhumed and then Wixom asked to approach. Uh, he approached the bench and they end up going into the uh, judges chamber, chambers, the attorneys and the judge. Uh, then when they are back, uh, Wix Wixom asked Powell what kind of things they look for to make sure there hasn't been any tampering at the site of when a body is exhumed. Powell said that at the grave site uh, they check the dirt. They check the gr growth of the grass. They checked actually the coffin itself. They then show uh, pictures of the day that Tammy was exhumed, and they describe everything that was going on down to uh, the cement vault being lifted out of the ground and the casket being removed after that. And Powell said of all the things that they're asked to check, he did not see any evidence that anyone had tampered with the gravesite. So basically... Wixom is trying to avoid prior saying that somebody planted stuff in Tammy's grave, messed with her body because Chad is so important. There's conspiracies. Um, so anyway, the casket was loaded into a hearse and taken to the Utah's medical examiner's office. And then the autopsy of Tammy Daybell is discussed with uh, autopsy photos. Another reason I cannot show images here. Powell uh, then explains that he served a warrant to Chad's home in January of 2020 and collected all the electronic devices so that he could take them over to the Fremont County Sheriff's Office. Um, and then uh, pretty much Wixom is done and Pryor begins to cross-examine. Uh, asked Powell if he had a camera in his car or a body camera. Powell says no. Pryor says it's important to get the facts from a witness and so cameras could be helpful, uh, but Pryor said, yes, it is a tool we use to make sure everybody's on the same page. And Powell says, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, Pryor then asks about the call uh, Powell received from Gilbert Police. Pryor explains that Powell uh, received information about Alex and Lori uh, prior to and about the shooting of potential shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. Pryor says as part of Powell surveillance, he was here to establish a relationship between Lori and Chad. So basically what all that means is that Pryor is trying to stipulate that Powell already had a preconceived assumption of relation between these three people, uh, Lori, Alex, and Chad. And Powell says, yes, because of what he was asked to do by Gilbert Police, i.e. look for the Jeep, uh, look for the two people that may be associated with the Jeep, and the fact that Chad Daybell was a local resident. Yes, he uh, he had some idea that there was probably some relationship between these individuals. 
So they are going on. Uh, so then uh, Pryor uh, asks Hal, what is so suspicious about two single people going to Hobby Lobby or going out to eat? He, Hal says, it's not suspicious. I just noted that that's what they did when I was asked to surveil them. Uh, and then Pryor shows uh, more medical records on of uh, Tammy's on the screen and points out the anxiety and depression. We all see where he's going with this. Uh, Pryor points out a family history listed on Tammy's record, uh, and that, uh, and then he now shows Tammy's death certificate. Pal, he asked Pal if he looked at the death certificate, and Pal said he did not. And then, uh, Pryor shows the police report, at least the Chad's version of the police report, uh, about what happened on the morning, the coughing, the fit the vomiting and then going to sleep and dying according to Chad. And then Pryor wants to make a big deal about Pal never looking at the death certificate. Pal said that he wasn't specifically investigating the death of Tammy Daybell until he was asked to exhume. So no, he had not looked at the death certificate prior. Um, and then uh, we go further into what Chad said that day and basically trying to set Tammy up as a very sick woman from Pryor's estimation. Uh, they also talk about how Chad told the, the coroner about the seizures and that how he did not want an autopsy and just a lot of stuff we already kind of know. So after all this painting of Tammy is a sick individual, body and soul and mind. Uh, Pryor releases the witness and Wixom has a few follow-up questions. He basically just comes right out and says that, uh, asks um, why they decided to look into Tammy Daybell's death and not just take Chad's word for it. That's the gist of it, as well as you know, pointing out that people that hold hands are probably a couple, as Pryor was trying to say, that doesn't necessarily mean they're a couple. But anyway, uh, Powell says, yes, there were other factors that led us to further investigate Tammy Daybell's death. Uh, he said that the strange behavior between Lori and Chad, the fact that they were obviously a couple, you know, the fact there could have been an affair and that affairs are often the motive in, uh, you know, deleting one's spouse. Uh, the strange goings on with the Jeep, uh, the fact that Gilbert police were also investigating other shenanigans all led to them pulling Tammy's potential death by murder into this whole shenanigans that it wasn't necessarily what happened that morning. It was other factors surrounding that came to light after. And then prior, um, uh, wants to, redirect uh prior acid pal is aware that chad is not implicated in the murder of charles and the attempted uh murder of brandon boudreau a point we are well aware of mr prior how said that he's aware of that prior asked because of these other deaths does, how does that give Powell the right to dig up tammy daybale and Powell says it's because of all the other information not brandon boudreau not charles Vallow, everything else from the missing of the children to the missing jeep to all the other stuff is why she was exhumed, Mr. Pryor, you blithering. Sorry. The state now calls um, FBI technician uh, Nicole Hydman. To the stand, she has worked for the FBI for 16 years. She came involved in the missing uh, children's case in early 2020 and was basically assigned to research data and phone attribution. And it is mainly to establish touch points, timeline, and who was talking to who. Uh, Prosecutor Lindsay Boatlake questions Heidman. Blake asked Heidman to, uh, asked to admit a PowerPoint pr presentation prepared by Heidman. And it shows the phone attribution of Chad, Lori, and Alex. Ch Chad had nine phone numbers, three of interest. Lori had six, three of interest. And uh, Alex had six, three of interest. Uh, the presentation shows all of their phone attribution and was done. The research was done between October 2018 and January 2020. 
Uh, Blake describes one of Chad's phone numbers and talks about all the various things from getting the reservations in Hawaii to helping to reserve the uh, uh, storage unit where some of uh, JJ and Tylee's things were later found. They also talk about who owns what uh, phone line. Uh, basically, all of his children looks like had a phone line. He had a phone line. Lori had a phone line. So everybody had a phone line. Uh, Blake asked Hydman, how does her research determine if numbers are legitimate? She says that she kind of monitors all of their calls and activity, and that tends to, tends to show which numbers are used more and which numbers are more legitimate to the question at hand. Uh, they talk about some of the activity of the Lori for style account uh all the text messages sent between what they determined to be Lori's number and what they determined to be chad's number and how some of those were obviously lovey-dovey and uh, things that would indicate a romantic relationship so basically what she's saying is that they didn't just say this is chad's number this is Lori's number and they're fooling around this was uh, a two-year investigation of all associated lines within all of the accounts belonging to Chad, Lori, and Alex. And this is how they put together all of this trail that we've come to know is most likely the truth. Uh, there is then uh, some discussion and uh, Blake asked to go into the judge's chambers and all the attorneys do that. Uh Blake then says that, that she is finished with uh, this exhibit and and this witness for the day and that court will would pick up the next day. So I will be back tomorrow with what happened today, April 16th, in the Chad Daybell trial. I hope you're enjoying this. And if you have any questions or concerns, let me know down below. I hope to see you back real soon. Until next time. Keto and cry.